All right, good evening, everyone. Now that we're hitting the six o'clock hour, I know it's been a long day. Thank you very, very much for your energy. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, lessons learned about let's serve hors d'oeuvres in the 20 minute pause in between panels. So yeah, lesson learned for the next one. But uh, hopefully you're enjoying them nonetheless. I'm sorry. Volume up. We will see here about that. All right. All right, is this a bit better? I'll just get a little bit lower since this thing is maxed out, it turns out. So good evening. Uh, welcome to the final plenary of the first day. Is everyone having a good conference so far? This has been great for me. Yeah. Excellent. So this, uh, my, okay, okay, okay. All right. So this plenary is an extension of the discussion uh, we were having earlier of where an organization like perhaps UDC can go next, if indirectly. The, uh, the intention behind this plenary is to have a discussion of academic labor uh, struggles today at base, but to expand upon this theme. So academic labor is something of a microcosm of the politics of neoliberal, or as some are even calling it now, mutant neoliberal times, of the production of knowledge itself across activist movements in regulatory settings and culturally in the broad. So we wanted to have a discussion that pulled from the political economy of knowledge itself and information in our academic settings alongside the crises and threats to academic labor that so many of us are trying to pay attention to or even feeling the pinches of. So we've assembled a panel of folks who have been deeply involved in all these kinds of struggles directly and in the production of information going into regulatory environments and beyond. And I'd like to introduce them and then we'll kick off uh, with a question. So starting from the second, from uh, the audience's right, Alison Hearn is a professor of media studies in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at the University of Western Ontario, and this year a visiting scholar here at Penn. Uh, her research focuses on the intersections of digital media, promotional culture, self-presentation, the credit economy, uh, and emerging forms of work. I mean, she focuses on what Jason Reed has called the micropolitics of capital, the non-economic and prosaic ways the prevailing logics of capitalism show up in our lives, summon us to become certain kinds of selves and feed on our affective responses in the process. Uh, she was herself president of the Western Ontario Faculty Association during a time of peak labor strife. Uh, she's also served as the chair of the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. Please give Allison a welcome, please. <laughs> All right, sitting to her, uh, her right, your left, is Natalie Fenton, who is a professor of media and communication at the University of London and co-director of the Center for the Study of Global Media and Democracy. You know, she works on issues of media justice, radical politics, uh, social economic democracy and equality, and asks what a democratic politics might mean in a digital age. You know, she was vice chair of the board of directors of the campaign group Hacked Off for seven years and is a founding member and former chair of the UK uh, Media Reform Coalition. Uh, she's also on the board of Declassified UK, an investigative uh, journalism website for in-depth analysis on British foreign policy and has a forthcoming book, Democratic Delusions, How the Media Hollowed Out Democracy and What We Can Do About It, which will be published by Polity in 2024. So welcome to you. Glad to have you. Uh, sitting closest to me is Mark Lloyd, who is an associate professor at McGill University in the Department of Art, History, and Communication Studies. Uh, professor Lloyd's current interests, teaching and research includes the role of a nation state in serving the critical information needs of local communities and the relationship between our communications ecology and democracy. And his rich background, he has been an Emmy, Emmy Award winning journalist uh, working for public and commercial radio and television. He served in the Clinton transition team and in the personnel office of the Clinton White House. Also served in the Biden Policy Committee on Innovation. He served as vice president for strategic initiatives at the Leadership Conference for Civil Civil Rights uh, and the Education Fund, director of the Media Policy Initiative at New America, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and the director of a research and advocacy group he co-founded, the Civil Rights Forum on Communication Policy. We're halfway there. From 2009 <laughs> to 2012, <laughs> no. you know, he also served in as associate general counsel in the Federal Communications Commission, uh, advising the commission on how to promote diverse participation in the communications field with a focus on research into critical information needs and broadband adoption by low-income uh, populations. I'll skip the second paragraph. 
paragraph. Welcome to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, sitting furthest from me is Todd Wolfson, who is Associate Professor of Journalism and Media Studies and co-director of the Mike Center here, one of our hosts. He served as president of Rutgers as, as a chapter of AAUP AFT, continuing to build on the foundational work of others in our midst like Deepa Kumar uh, to generate a militant cross-campus solidarity that led to the successful strike and subsequent contract victories. Hopefully you've been following this year. Yeah, it's a very big deal. He's also the co-founder of the Media Mobilizing Project based here in Philadelphia, which aims to use new media and communications to build a movement of poor and working people united across color lines. So with this group, you know, in, in thinking through uh, academic labor in the broadest terms, a question that arose in our correspondence leading up to this that might sound you know, a little bit kludgy, but kind of perfect for a 6.05 p.m. gathering. We're going to ask the question, how can academic labor, in all of its various conditions and contexts, challenge the deeply entangled relationship between institutions of higher education, mutant uh, linear liberalism, and global finance capitalism? I'm going to start with an easy one. Yeah. So, wherever, <laughs> so we would like to start <laughs> this one. He's got slides. She's got notes, so I say one of those. I'm with you, Natalie. I'm under the bus. <laughs> you decide. How about, you're the chair. Dr. Hearn. Why don't we start with the notes? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm really glad you all have had a drink. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, because you make me nervous, I'm going to read a little something and then stop. So this was a question that Natalie and I came up with. Natalie and I are both here as visiting scholars, and uh, I keep joking that it's like we're on and uh, we're you know we're roommates. Uh, we're we're like foreign students in a foreign land, and um, but we were talking about this question of how our universities have become so deeply. I mean, there have been so many phrases, right? Corporatized, neoliberalized, financialized. And what would the role of academic labor unions be in trying to challenge that? And so I'm just going to read a little bit. I, I, I mean, I could go on and on, and I know everybody in this room could go on and on about the ways that they have witnessed the impacts of this form of financialization. And you know, there are myriad uh, ways in which our universities now express the logics of finance capital. Now a mall a bank, an entertainment complex, a branded lifestyle, a trademark, a construction site, a tourist destination, a research and development corporation, and a retail enterprise that peddles innovation and creativity alongside its branded hats and hoodies. We might see the university in the West today as an expression of what Callison and Manfredi have called mutant neoliberalism. It's definitely a mutant institution a toxic conglomeration of capitalist political economic governance via sets of privatized technologies and modes of organization, masquerading under sets of antiquated Eurocentric rationalities and explanations, and enacting forms of anachronistic political theater, uh, I'm thinking here of convocation, uh, that work to shape our subjectivities and create sets of conditions that many of us, whether we acknowledge or not, simultaneously reject and embrace. I think all of us who work inside the university today inhabit a double consciousness. Um, the Western University has become, in Brian Whitener's and Dan Nemser's terms, the new university of circulation, an institution primarily dedicated to facilitating the flows of overaccumulated finance capital trading students, construction contracts, endowments, and debt with all the alacrity of a Wall Street brokerage firm. We can see this in so many ways, uh, primarily in the precarity, the addiction to adjunct labor, contract faculty, uh, through forms of outsourcing we don't even recognize, which is ed tech, which is a huge issue. Uh, the de-skilling and the deprofessionalizing we all undergo every day. Uh, corporate governance, the displacement of collegial governance, and any notion of the university as a collective project. Um, uh, the use of responsibility-centered management budgeting, which is just like a complete, pardon me, shit show. Yeah. 
uh, the concealing of funds, the uh, entrepreneurialism in the professoriate, uh, the move away from the idea of the university as a public mission. So, and, and, and also in the rise of student indebtedness, of course, which uh, so many people have written so eloquently about, uh, you know, debt as a pedagogy, debt teaches uh, people, uh, our students, uh, to be docile and um, burdens them and, and is playing a huge role. So I, I don't want I want to just talk a little bit about the situation in Canada and talk about how I see the role of academic labor unions, uh, in my opinion, paying a, a really crucial central role in challenging these things, in disentangling them, in calling them out. Uh, in Canada, over the last few years, we've seen a new wave of labor militancy, uh, as, as we've seen around the world, really. Uh, but amongst education workers. Um, in, uh, in the last two years, there have been more strike actions in Canada than there have been in the last 10 years, including, and in Canada, every university has its own, um, either union or faculty association. We've seen 11 strikes. Um, many of them were resolved in binding arbitration, which is good, others settled. Uh, the best wins came from those unions who followed the organizing for the common good model, uh, mobilizing heavily beforehand, uh, organizing, we were just in a panel before this, door knocking, the only way to go. You have to show up where people are. Um, but in any case, I, I'll, I'll stop there and let other people say more and come back to the details of what's happening in Canada. But I, one of the crucial things for all of us as we think about what we can do is to recognize where we are. The university is not for us anymore. Um, we, and I think there's a lot of misrecognition that the primary role of the university is teaching and research. Uh, when you really look at what the institution is, I think we have to be so wide-eyed and cold and look at where is the money, follow the money. And the first step for us to organize effectively and fight back is to remember and realize and study where we are, that it's not this, it's not what we think. We're not, we're, we're not in Kansas anymore. I'm just gonna follow on, because that sure. goes quite um, nicely, I think. So that immediately raises the question to me of how complicit are we mm -hmm. in our daily lives, in the work that we do, in the courses that we teach, in the ways that we relate to other staff and to our students. What is it that we are um, bringing to the table? What responsibility are we taking for the continuation of this system of a heavily commodified knowledge production factory? And I think um, that's a question that plagues me every day of my working life in the UK. And of course in the UK, I, you know, I can remember, I had a free university. I didn't pay fees. I got paid um, a, a, a grant to go to university and I got fair rented, so I didn't even have to pay for my flat. So you know, now in, you know, the UK bought in fees for higher education in 1998, which were a thousand pounds then. A few years later, they tripled those to 3,000, and then a few years later, they went up to 9,000. And then they removed all of the block teaching grant from the state for arts and humanities courses. We've stuck with a 9,000 pound grant. They haven't given us any more money. Of course, the cost of living and rates of inflation have gone up very much since then. So universities are left with particularly running um, arts colleges with very little finance, students are in huge debt. So it's almost a, a double bind where the institutions, the only way they can go is to cut staff and pile in the students. So nobody is happy in this situation. Nobody's really wins. We've been on strike every year now since 2018. Um, there are some universities and we have a very heavily unionized sector in the UK, we have a single main union, we combined unions, um, uh, you know, I can't remember now, about two decades ago. And we are now, um, a, you know, my department is 80% un unionized, Goldsmiths itself is, has a very high union membership. 
Um, it, it is not difficult for us to call out strike action, but the solutions are very hard to come by. You know, where do we go? This is not necessarily, it's a government solution, actually. It is not a solution that is gonna come from those individual universities. So I'd like to talk at some point around the differences between context and conditions of the marketized and commodified institution, the different types of actions that you can take as well. You know, we have a, a university Brighton University in the UK that's now been on um, all out strike for 100 days. Um, that's hardcore, you know, that's really difficult. That's, and, you know, we know we're going in, uh, we just assume now we're going to be on strike <laughs> every year. Just, and there seems to be a tyranny to that, but I can't see any other option. So where else do you go? Because there is no, you know, withdrawing your labor is the main thing we can do. And I think what one of the things that has done is it has very much made people move away from this idea of yourself as the prof professionalized um, teacher or the professionalized um, professor even, to feeling a worker. You very much feel when you withdraw your labor and your money stops, you very much feel a worker. And, and also unions have to really step up to the mark to provide strike funds and to really support workers throughout it. You feel a new sense of solidarity with your comrade workers through that. But there's also a limit to that, right? There's a limit to how long you can keep repeating those actions without actually making much progress. There have been some wins, I have to say. There have been some wins. But it's... Uh, and, and the other thing I would like to also figure out is how we can extend an international solidarity in a, in a different and more vibrant way than we have been able to do so far. And I don't think that should be beyond the bounds of our capacities either. And to think more creatively about the sorts of actions we do and take and, um, and, and also to rethink, and this comes back to some of the conversations I've been part of today, to start rethinking what we want our universities to be. Because I think you've got to have, to take effective action, you've got to have a vision. And the vision is not just about, um, you know, well, we, we want an extra 5%. Or we want, um, uh, you know, we want you to stop giving out quite so many casualized contracts. It's got to be bolder than that. I don't think we're going to keep people fighting for this cause unless we have a real vision about what it means to have a, a, a kind of you know, decommodified university without a market system in a fully democratic and cooperative form. So that's our song. I, know, I, feel, I, feel I want to give space to the slides. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks, Russ, for organizing this, and, and thanks to UDC, of course. This is a really important space. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, so I, I really appreciate Allison's uh, portrait, and I, I think I, I had this uh, mentor once who told me, you have to know what you're fighting, right? And he would say, if you think you're fighting a teddy bear and you're going to be fighting a grizzly bear, you're in trouble, right? Um, and so you, 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 we have to know what we're up against or we're gonna get, and we have been getting, our ass kicked, right? Um, and so having a real analysis of what the university is in the 21st century is critical to knowing how to fight back. Um, and, and I just wanna like talk a little bit from the US perspective, but start where Natalie put us, which is that in the UK they at once had free higher ed, right? And guess what? We did in the U.S. too, right? CUNY, the UCs, they were free. Public, we had public universities that were free. And the state and the federal government divested in them in the 70s, and we've seen a long arc of crisis in higher ed in the U.S. from there forward. And we, we have to be clear about that. And we have to be clear that it wasn't, it's not just some economic card trick, it was political and racial, right? The, the divestment, it happened as people of color were getting broad access to free higher ed in New York City and in California, and it happened on the heels of the long 60s when our campuses were central to the struggles 
of that period. And it's not some conspiracy. The education, the head of education in, in California said, we cannot pay for an educated proletariat. It cannot be a free education. And that's when divestment happened in the US. It's been political from the 70s, and it's political today, right? And so we got to be really clear. And, and that, the, the divestment of our federal and state funding of our universities has all the outcomes that Allison's flagged, right? And we know them, and we live with them. Mounting student debt, what, 1.7 trillion? Something like that? But not just student debt, and that's where we often lead it, leave it, but also institutional debt. My university thinks first and foremost, what's its Moody rating to get to where, what our relationship is to finance capital? First question, how good is our Moody rating, right? That's what they think about. Second, we have to pay our debt service, right? That's the, neat, that's the central set of questions that the university, every one of our universities is asking and answering. And it's not just debt, it's a dependency, an addiction on contingency, right? How many times have I been with those vampires bargaining where they talk about their need for flexibility? Their flexibility to fire an adjunct after one semester or hire them a week into the semester. Their flexibility to treat grad workers like uh, armies of unpaid servants. Their flexibility with postdocs and visiting researchers and more and more, and, and full-time non-tenure, and more and more the tenure track. And, and I'll say this to tenure faculty, we've been sitting in a pot of boiling water without even realizing it for a really long time and we're basically cooked if we don't start to change our attitude about being workers and aligning ourselves with the workforce. So there's a lot of other outcomes too and we can get to it, right? <laughs> Penn, Penn. Penn is a great example, but so is my University of Rutgers, of universities that extract from the communities they're in. They go in with their octopus tentacles to Varian Baldwin. If you haven't read his work, you really should. He's written really cogently on this, about how universities put their tentacles in the communities and extract the resources out from them. And so our, relationship, our university's relationships to their communities is exploitative and extractive. Um, and we could go on, but another, one important point to, to note is the growth of the bureaucratic class that runs our institutions, right? That has to be noted. Um, and, and that's an important point. There is a, a massive explosion of these, what is, what, what's it called, the deanlets and deanlings, et cetera, um, that very few come out of the, of the academy. Some do, but most don't. And most of them see their, uh, their kind of vision of the world as a neoliberal business logic, and they run our, their universities as such. So when we were bargaining over pandemic, or even, and Andrew did a really good job, I don't see where he is, but Andrew did a really good job talking about the strike earlier today at Rutgers, but when we were bargaining, the people across the table, none of them come out of the academy, they're all lawyers, or human resource, um, you can go right down the line. So, so that's what our universities are, and there's an arc that shows us how it's become, and its relationship to financial capitalism is, is deep and it means that our approach and response has to, to recognize that and respond to that. And so I'm not gonna get into details about the response. I think we'll do that in more detail in later questions, but I'll say this clearly. We have to organize wall to wall and we have to organize coast to coast, right? Enough of our divisions by job category. It doesn't work, it fails all of us. Tenure track faculty are the ones who do it the most and it is not serving anyone. But the realities of organizing across job category is that it's friggin' hard. We're in a university that's hierarchical, and those hierarchies exist, and then they bleed into our organizing, right? And so we have to think really clearly about how do you organize across job category, recognizing that your employment is based on that hierarchy. Um, so there's a lot of work for us to do, but wall to wall, we, can, we, we have to build with every worker on our campus because it's the only way we have the power to muster the change we need, coast to coast, we need in this country. They have it in Canada and in the UK at least. They have sectoral union. We're split across like 20 national unions in our higher ed and that means there's no voice, no vision, and no uh, power. And so that's what we gotta respond to. I'll leave it there. No, thank you. I can operate with slides if you want to do it from there. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you could do that, that would be great. Can sure. you hear me? Um, I think you've heard a bit of my strange resume. Um, I am uh, a very young academic, even though I'm an old man. Uh, it is really wonderful to sort of uh, engage with you a little bit about something that I think I know something about, which is uh, organizing and how does one accumulate power and engage with power. Um, the reason to be concerned about this is, to some extent, both the present and what's happened in the past, but also the future. Um, if you think that writers and um, actors and auto workers are organizing just for new wages, but they are not concerned about AI and how that's going to affect their jobs, you're not understanding what's going on now. And if you think auto workers and writers and actors should be worried about their jobs, mm -hmm. you might be worried about your jobs, mm -hmm. however you classify yourself <laughs> in the academy. Um, I think we've talked a little bit about organizing. I have a daughter who's just taken up a job at the University of Reading uh, and is very glad that she is in the UK because there is a union. Uh, and she complains regularly about the strikes, all sorts of strikes, about all sorts of things, <laughs> including whether we're going to take the train or, you know, or the tube or what we're going to do. Uh, but she's glad that she's there and she's got a certain set of rights that she is assured of uh, as a, a budding professor uh, because there is a union. Uh, what is the role of UDC in shaping the future relationship between academic labor and digital technology, and between academic labor and the future? Um, I mean, I think one of the roles of these conferences is not just convening, but actually sort of connecting people, uh, moving forward positions. Uh, the extent to which that can be done, I think you've got to jump on what's happening, but you are certainly behind the ball. Um, we, are, we are nowhere close to where the UK is. Uh, I'm at McGill in Canada and Montreal. Uh, I, I wish we were, uh, I think, doing much better than we are in Canada, but we've, we've got some challenges too. Uh, I am, as you've probably guessed from my, uh, th the short bit of the resume that, that Russ gave you, uh, I am an American um, and, uh, again, a young academic, and uh, the U.S. academic community is in trouble. Regarding the future, not regarding particular individual people and their roles, maybe, for at least another five or so years. But looking beyond that, I think it's going to be a challenge. One of the things that I think I was able to do before I was at the Federal Communications Commission and trying to do actually some organizing when I was at the FCC was to do some organizing around uh, the opportunity of the transition from analog to digital television. Uh, we called our organizing effort after a while something called People for Better TV, and we organized in about 12 different communities, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Boston, there were a few others. Uh, we reached out to organizations like uh, the National Organization for Women, um, the NAACP, uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Consumer Federation of America, uh, to see if they could get their members to organize in particular communities and so that we could start organizing those particular communities. We did research by figuring out what it was that local television stations were doing and what they weren't doing, having some suspicion that they weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And we had uh, an advocate, again, at the FCC, who actually happened to be a former board member of uh, a teen shelter that I was also a board member. His name was Bill Kennard. And we were both with a group called Sasha Bruce Youth Work, helping teens in trouble. 
As a result of that, and as a result of work that I was able to do with uh, Clinton White House and, and, uh, and the Vice President, we were able to actually move uh, a petition to get things through the FCC to finally establish some rules for broadcasters. All that went away uh, when uh, the Supreme Court decided to stop the count of the vote in Florida, and we ended up with uh, Shrub as the new president and not Gore. Um, I went away to MIT to, again, figure out what the hell had happened and uh, to try to understand the historical context of all of this. We are at some important inflection points now. One is the considerable fright. It's not a mere concern, but there is fright at almost every level of government in the United States to some limited extent in Canada. There should probably be more in Canada than there is. But there's certainly fright in the United States about what AI is going to do, what it's going to mean, what it's going to mean for the economy, what it's going to mean for lots of things. Uh, this is an opportunity to actually have an impact on what's going on. And there is in the United States uh, uh, an ongoing presidential election. <laughs> These are important inflection points. These are opportunities to have an impact on change. What power do you as, as a member of the academic community have? Uh, you do have numbers. Whether it's community colleges, whether it's adjuncts, whether it's uh, non-tenure track faculty, whether it's tenure track, whether it's the workers at the variety of universities and uh, tertiary institutions, you have numbers. And you have authority. There are still some people, at least to, to some extent, in the Biden administration. You have to hit them over the head with a hammer sometimes. But there are people who will listen to people who are experts and who can claim expertise. Uh, this is an important power that you have, that not ordinary citizens in the United States have. Numbers and authority. Uh, this, is, this is not bad. We've already mentioned, I think, one of the core levers of power. One clearly is lacking in the United States, and that is unionization. Uh, and I mean standing together as a group willing to withhold labor. Uh, imagine if all of those, uh, the folks who were striking here at Penn, uh, that all the academics joined them. Uh, I think, you know, what happened with uh, the writer's strike, I think they were, uh, to some extent, empowered because the actors decided to go on strike and put pressure on. How many of you here are a member of a union? Okay. That's, that's, that's not bad. Ask how many <clears throat> would want to be. How many would want to be? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Yeah, if you're if you're if you're if you're not, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. 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 So this is that. This is this is an extraordinary, with a with a president who claims to actually be on the side of unions. Uh, you actually have power to sort of change that conversation about why you can't be a part of a union. Um, understanding potential allies with power. And you do have allies with power. There are allies with power in the government. It's sort of hard to see them. I was one of those allies with power in government. I had a limited amount of power, but I could actually get a few things done. I could get some studies done and push some things and certainly get enough people angry with me. They thought I had powers. <laughs> um, there are actually people in media. Some of them are a bit confused about, you know, <laughs> their role in society and what media is. Um, but they are certainly sympathetic. I think there are certainly people in media who understand what the challenges are, particularly around the challenges related to things like student debt and uh, the exploitation of adjuncts and things like that. I mean, there are people in media who certainly understand the challenges faced by academic labor. And believe it or not, there are pe people in business who understand some of those challenges. 
uh, in part because they sort of need academic labor to make themselves successful in a coming world of AI. Figuring out who those allies are, how to work with them is extraordinarily important. One of the most difficult things regarding organizing is getting the funding to do it. Um, I won't sort of go into my woes about funding, uh, but for those of you who are close to funders, who have sympathetic funders who will listen to you, they don't seem to listen to me anymore, but if they listen to you, you may actually have a way to convince them to support some of your efforts. There's a, there's a place to do some work here, and there, there is an opportunity. Um, again, uh, it's hard. <laughs> There's no question that it's hard. Um, any even limited beginning, whether it is in a particular academic institution or community, certainly nationally, uh, you should expect tension with allies, with some of your closest allies. <laughs> and not just tension, but deliberate disruption of what it is that you believe you've agreed to do. Uh, I know this from hard experience. It's the reason I have the amount of hair that I have and, the gray, and, and how gray my hair is, believe me. Uh, and be open to strategic opportunities. Um, again, there are folks in business who understand the challenges, and there may be some strategic opportunities to work with them, uh, but you have to be very careful of corrupting influences. It is a challenge. It's one of the things that can create deliberate disruption among some of the closest allies. And never give up. Organizing um, for change is not a job. It's not a job. <laughs> it's not, you know, you're a worker and you're doing this because, you know, and you can sort of take it off and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, it. It is hard work. It is hard, frustrating, challenging work. It is, unfortunately for me, a calling. Um, I wish it were not. Um, but I don't see another way um, to move it forward. I wish I did. I mean, I wish um, conferences like this could sort of congeal and you know, everyone could hold hands and we could sort of you know, <laughs> see the Pentagon lift or like, whatever it is. Uh, that, that would be, but that's, that's, that's not going to do it. Um, and figuring out, again, where those inflection points are and how to get in there and to use them effectively, um, yeah, that's, that's what I've spent bouncing around in all these different places trying to figure out how to do and, and how to move. And that's why, you know, to some extent, I was bouncing around in all those different places. Um, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, this, this actually provides a perfect segue to where we wanted to go next, which is a question of brass tacks, like actual strategies that all of you who have been involved in such movements you know, would recommend keeping, have been successful for you. But one of the reasons that we talk about this term mutant neoliberalism, I mean, where it comes from, is this notion that over time the contradictions which have arisen thanks to neoliberal imperatives you know, the, the, the identified solution to the problems wrought by neoliberalism, those in this room might guess, is probably more neoliberalism. <laughs> and this has become weird. And there's this move, there's an entire, you know, folks who are not paying attention to the law and political economy section, which is starting to grow out of the critical legal academy. There's a lot of room for cross-pollination here. They're thinking about you know, ways in which the old market-based solutions are becoming state driven market institutions. We're going to use industrial policy in almost neoliberal weird ways. In such a context, I mean, universities and colleges, you know, their own roles start to morph and shift in ways and result in the kinds of things we're hearing about here. 
I suppose you know, my big question to those who have found some success with this, you know, what strategies would you recommend to a room of folks who either are in a position to organize or want to? You know, and what headwinds do you imagine these folks would face that are different than the ones that perhaps you even faced? In 30 seconds or less each, please. <laughs> no, so, <laughs> no. Okay, so I'm going to quickly just follow on uh, uh, from this um, idea of recognizing who our enemy is. And I, and I uh, really, Natalie and I have spoken a lot about the situation in the UK and the per state of a perpetual strike, labor withdrawal. And uh, I really feel strongly that, that, that as you organize, whether you're unionized or not, you, ha you have to understand who your enemy is. And that means that sometimes the withdrawal of labor isn't the only option. And in fact, if you imagine the university is not really that interested in teaching students, the students are sort of part of it, then you think about, well, what can we do to really hit them where they live? In other words, where can, what other actions could we possibly do to, to wreck havoc? Um, Shutting down construction sites, for example. Um, reputational damage is always a great one. Any kind of social media campaign, and U of T did that very successfully around a censure that the CAUT imposed last year. Um, so if you imagine this contemporary university of circulation, then you think about where is its, where are its tender spots. Um, publicize the budgetary spending, publicize the amount of money that's spent on this managerial class that we've seen grow and balloon out of all uh, proportion. Um, target money-making sports events and venues like the students at the University of Missouri did several years ago. Um, and they, they got their football team on side and, and they, they got their president ousted. Um, for for racist for not doing enough to address racism on campus, um, and target suppliers and affiliated companies and businesses, uh, as well as sponsors and donors. So we have to think kind of beyond the actual strike. Strikes are great and they can really do a lot, but they're also come at a really high price. So I think that there just needs to be a lot of thinking about how can we diversify our, uh, our attitudes and our actions against our employers? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, building on that, I, I think all of this is um, really good wisdom, actually. But I think there comes a point, um, and you will get to this point, where you, when you are in constant industrial dispute, um, where you have to get really creative about how to sustain energies and to keep the mobilizations going and and to keep up hope actually so and I, and I do think some of those things also introduce some fun into the context, which is quite important and I was just thinking back at when these questions were asked some of the most successful mobilizations we 've done at goldsmiths have been about working across students and staff, so the whole staff body yep. with all of our students. And they have been both um, educational for staff and students, um, and also incredibly therapeutic, but also really um, kind of brought things home. And one thing we did, which was, I mean, this is just purely anecdotal, but we did a, um, we put goldsmiths on trial. So we had a mock trial for goldsmiths, which was, and it was absolutely fantastic. We're an arts college, right? So we did it full on, big style, um, a proper court set up, and, and people came and gave witness to the trauma, actually, of, of teaching in these institutions and also learning in them. And those of you who know Mark Fisher's work, um, Capitalist Realism, he I mean, it was a, just the most um, incredibly moving scene, actually, as Mark came up and gave his witness statement about um, the trauma he felt working within the institution. And these things then 
became incredibly, um, you know, they developed their own momentum. And out of that, we established a student staff assembly, which met regularly. We developed a thing called the Gold Paper, which was a, a, in the UK, we have these things called white papers, which are policy briefing papers on things to come, on higher education policy. They come endlessly. They're always bad news. So we thought, let's do a gold paper. Let's, let's map out what we would like the university to be. And also to have um, it not just be a utopian idea, but practical steps. Let's have a short-term, medium-term, long-term aims and objectives. And that was... that spun out to the rest of the university sector. Suddenly everybody was doing it and it was a real, and then COVID hit, right? So we then, things, we haven't been able to get that momentum back, but just this week we've started again rethinking, let's come back to the staff student assemblies, let's start organizing again around. And the key thing there for many institutions was the, the primary ask became, we want to democratize the institution. We want to say, in how things are being run and what things are being done. So when we have our finance committees, who in the UK now basically our, our boards of governors are made up of bankers, you know, that's it. it's like actually, surely that's where we've got to attack first. Mm -hmm. That is not, if, if that changed, the situation would change. So it has to be about, you know, kind of getting creative and clever at the same time, and then I do think there are real possibilities. Um, you know, I, I was thinking when we were talking about this, that, that famous saying, the tradition of all dead generations weighs on, like a nightmare on the brain of the living, right? And so like, we feel like we're trapped um, in our strategies, but we're not. Um, UAW, is doing some of the most innovative yep. work yep. for a really long time. The stand-up strike is beautiful. It, it moves leverage, it, it, it's fantastic. And two years ago, no one in this country thought UAW would be leading the labor movement, and right now they are, right? So, like, there's a lot more, we have a lot more to be optimistic about than we, we know. Um, and we're also in the middle of, probably the highest wave of labor militancy in this country that we've seen in God knows how long. And, and for the first time, for the first time in this history of this country, higher ed is one of the leading sectors. One of the leading sectors. The most new, biggest unions in the country last year were for, out of higher ed, mostly grads. Um, and you know some of the, the most militant strikes in the last year have come out of higher ed. Um, so the sector is leading. I, I'll just say to get to like brass tacks really briefly, like we have to operate at multiple scales, right? We have to think about our institutions. And at the local level, again, we need to organize, organize, organize. But if you organize in a job category and you don't think about how, bu how building a wall-to-wall -wall institution um, it can work, you're, you're not going to be able to build the power necessary to challenge what's in front of you. Right? I, I just want to be clear about that. There is amazing shit going on at Penn right now. The grads get up 3.0. I was part of get up 1.0. You guys are amazing. I'm super excited about that. Um, we see residents organizing. We see librarians organizing. We see postdocs organizing. Maybe I should say. <laughs> anyway, um, there's, there's such an opportunity, but you need to organize both in your job category and across it, and you need to build alignment now. Um, so, and, and then one other thing about what we need to think about in our institutions is our contract that we fight over only um, controls a very small sliver of the life of the university. So we need to look at universities like the University of Mexico, the Autonomous University, or our friends in Northern Europe that have work councils, right, that govern over a large a much larger part of the life of the university, right? Some of them, UNAM has a control over hiring the president and the budget, right? So, I mean, we have to start to think about what that looks like in this country. So that's at the local level. At the national level, again, in the US context, we are split across 20 parent unions. The only voice talking about higher education today is Ron friggin' DeSantis. 
<laughs> Ron DeSantis, that friggin' nightmare out of Florida. We have no national voice. We have no counter imaginary about what the university should be. And the only way to get a counter imaginary is to build a national movement and have that national movement talk about and revalorize the university. Because if we don't do that, there's no way we're gonna change this fight. And so we have to, and the only way to do that is to build a national movement. And I would say, and my, my friends in, in the national unions that I'm a part of don't love this, we need a sectoral organization. We need an organization that represents all higher ed workers. That's why UAW is so damn strong. Right? They represent all auto workers, and now they represent the people making the electric, you know, they, they're thinking ahead, to Mark's point, uh, about the future of their sector. So that's how we build the power. And, and the last thing I'll say is we need to politicize this fight, right? It's a political fight. We need socialized higher ed. That's what we need in this country. And we need to make an argument for that, and that argument demands valorizing it. So we need local, strong locals that are focused on building wall to wall. We need um, a national movement of workers, and we need a political campaign that demands a full, fully funded higher ed. That's, the, that's a roadmap. That's in front of us, but we got the work to do to get there. So I, I, I think that's great. The only thing that, well, let me add a couple things. One is that there is an extraordinarily strong and growing movement among students around debt. Joining with that movement and supporting that union, that movement would be very yep. useful. Uh, it is a movement that has actually pushed the President of the United States to try to find multiple ways to ease student debt. That didn't come about by accident or because, you know, President Biden's just a good guy. There is, there is a student movement behind it. You have allies, again, um, amongst you, um, and they should be joined. In addition to the other allies of uh, You've got writers who are just coming out of the academy who, you know, just won a big strike. <laughs> um, figuring out how to join with other active unions who have done a good job of organizing is important. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the point that Todd made about the fact that this is, of course it's political. Um, but you have to make it a political issue. Just like there were students who made student debt a political issue. You have to make recovering the academy from what it was in the 60s that, you know, Mario Savio was arguing about at Berkeley. You have to make it a political issue. Uh, and it's, it's amazing that that, that, that spirit, uh, which, you know, moved from, you know, Berkeley to Michigan to Columbia to a variety of other, Wisconsin and other schools is just, has just died out, uh, which is about democratizing universities, democratizing higher ed. So you have, you have precedent there, you have allies who are already moving on this front. Um, you know, as in, in terms of next steps, uh, you've got uh, the Union of Democratic Communications that can actually, you know, pull together a small group of people and put out a plan and find out if everybody on the mailing list agrees and figure out how to move from here and start moving. And with that plan, you can actually go, I think, to funders who might be interested, including uh, funders who are actors and maybe on strike themselves and making lots of money. Um, so there, there is a way to sort of think about organizing this. And again, uh, we are at an inflection point. Um, and a, a lot of this is going to be, you know, do you really want your children learning from a computer? Um, what does that look like? Um, what do we do about this? And how can we as academics join you in figuring out what to do about AI? I mean, there, there are opportunities to participate in this conversation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to take the next few moments to take some questions from our audience. I see you, Didi. Yeah. One of the resources that we have are the community uh, radio stations yep. and the, yep. uh, the 
educational radio stations and the TV stations. Uh, one, uh, one of my uh, interests at UCSD was to get a, a low power station and Michael uh, Cousins, who recently died, was an FCC person, I'm sure Mark knows it, uh, who helped us and came to, and we got a low power license and then we got on the satellite and uh, we thought the students were going to have a voice, the teachers were going to have a voice. We were totally locked out. It became a P, the, the PR department took it over. So that I bet a lot of universities, actually the best example was Drexel, which through George McCullough had a really terrific uh, TV station here that, that before there was public access, it answered the need for community TV. So we should take any of those resources that this that the universities have and make sure that they are democratic and open to student work and also uh, critical communications. Thank you. Maybe take a few more? Sure, absolutely. Let's take a couple questions. We'll take a couple and then we'll toss it you know, to them. Let's, let's start with you, please. And tell us your name. We're a small oh. conference. We should know each other. <laughs> My name is Stephanie um, and I'm from CSU. And I had a question, because I know I was talking about, with our union, about new student workers. People who are freshly entering the university, they're so excited to be there. And we struggle with seeing how they, to get them involved, so that they know, hey, we need to stick together. It's not just, if our faculty goes on strike, we need to be there to support them, because we're struggling together. One of the big things that the university tried to do was eliminate sympathy striking for us, and that was a huge no on my end and they didn't and I'm like thank you for not settling because <laughs> that's a huge important thing for us to stick together so how what are some solutions you would come up with to get our younger students to recognize their position in the university if not alienating them to get them to understand that we can stand together that collects a couple more and then we'll take off okay let's see is uh, you want to scream your your summary please Stephanie students or our newer student workers to join faculty in striking, understanding their rights, and seeing what we can do with that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please. The reason behind my unseemly outburst, <laughs> this is great. Um, so specifically, I'm at a Catholic university where when people have tried to unionize in the past, they've been punished. Yep. Because the you know allegiance to Dorothy Day is rhetoric only, uh, and we have a big business school where the vast majority of the faculty there are enemies against us. We have political scientists who are lecturing us about how we are managers, not workers. So I'm very curious about the hurdle of you know I understand the exhortation not to despair, but boy, it seems like you know Sisyphus in a situation like that. Yeah. What can we do? Can I add yeshiva to the pile? Right? <laughs> Anyone at a private college in the United States, yeshiva decision says faculty are managers, not yeah. labor. And you exactly. Yeah. So it's a way of pulling the rug out. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take your question, then I'll come to you. And say your name. Yeah. Please say your name. Hey, um, I'm Ian Gavin. Uh, I'm my fellow at the PhD student history um, And I guess one question I'm interested in hearing more from the panels about and from others is um, uh, as a story like going so so it's like when we had free tuition in this country it was because we were living under a different political alignment a different political order that was created because of the strength of the left and the organized labor movement and a kind of much broader set of social formations and actors that created a kind of conditions for for politics and institutions that um, look different than what preceded them and look different than what we have and what we have right now is because of a completely different alignment that we live under, which is the neoliberal alignment. And so I guess the, the question to me is, um, obviously it's important that we build uh, up, to, up to the limits that we can build on in our own institutions, but how do we, uh, how do we take, uh, how, how do we organize in our context in ways that also build um, a larger formation, larger political formation that's, that, that is 
aim towards a different kind of alignment, because at the end of the day, we're not gonna fix these universities on their own. We need a different political alignment. And so what are, what are the concrete things we advance? You know, we have to get better contracts, right? That's, that's our jobs when we're unionized. Not, not everyone is, and probably not everyone will be. Um, but in any event, I think my, my question's clear. Just curious to hear what you think. I'll keep my promise. One more. Please say your name. Hi, my name another Stephanie uh, from the University of Illinois. Um, and I actually, I, I, I don't mean to sound stereotypical, it's less a question than a comment, but I would like to urge everyone also to look ahead to the potential Yahtzee strike that might happen next year. Because production, like America, does not run on Duncan, it runs on labor. So feel free to also, um, you know, I'm sorry? What's the Yahtzee? I A T S E. Yahtzee, the labor the laborers of, of media production mm -hmm. are set to either um, to renegotiate their contract coming up in twenty twenty four. If they go on strike, we do not have television or film. So <laughs> um, but as far as the creative labor goes, I think creative labor, intellectual labor go hand in hand with the physical labor of the university. So I would encourage us all to think about the dual strikes, right? Or the, the student strikes, yes, we're important, but also think about like joining hands with the janitors, the people yep. who clean the bathrooms, the people who paint the walls, who construct the college, right? I, I mean, I don't know. Less a comment than an announcement. <laughs> Thank you for that. I do think the city of Boston would disagree. I think the entire Back Bay is actually built on a foundation of Duncan, but we'll just turn this to, <laughs> we'll turn to the panel. So, responses to our various pile of issues. For anyone who'd like to, briefly. Yeah. Well, so regarding the question about students, and um, it, it, it certainly can be a challenge. Uh, I, a number of panels actually talked about teach-ins. Um, and there was a time when there were teach-ins that were going on, whether it was about uh, Vietnam, whether it was about um, uh, civil rights, whether it was about you know the Native American population, whether a, a variety of things. But they seemed to sort of spread across the U.S. Um, teach-ins about this, Te uh, just a, a teach-in about student debt. Uh, you'd get some students there, I think. <laughs> Uh, but sort of spreading that out so that you can talk about what these issues are. And again, thinking about um, there are students who want to be, believe it or not, in academia. Why that is, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. But they want to be in academia, having them sort of look toward the future, what that looks like, and thinking that through, would, you know, that would be a decent teach-in. So uh, I think teach-ins at universities, uh, community colleges, wherever it is, and these things end up spreading to YMCA's and all sorts of organizations, would be a useful to make sh a way to sort of help. And uh, you will not get everyone involved, <laughs> but you'll get a, a core group of enough people involved to actually have a movement happen. And just building that, we have a long history of teachings in the UK, and I think, I can't remember a time we've never had, I mean, when you go on strike, it's not like you just stop working, the whole thing is about teachings. So we organize multiple teachings on multiple subjects, we bring other strikers in from other unions to talk about their actions, and we talk about history of strike action, student activism, we, we try and it, it's very much a process of learning actually, the whole uh, action. And that comes back to that larger political formation, which is also just, we don't just do teach-ins, but we also do kind of drop-ins. So when we're building for mobilizations, we drop, in other words, you drop into people's lectures. And you, you talk in the lectures uh, and in those spaces around those subjects and you orient the teaching in that space and time to those issues and context. But the thing that's really shifted in the UK over the last 12 months, I think, because we had a winter of discontent, another one, with multiple strikes across multiple sectors, what was very successfully done this time was linking up higher education with those other sectoral strikes. In a way, we were always before, well, you lot just do this thing called research. <laughs> You're not real workers. You take three months off every summer. 
you know, you're in these privileged institutions, you're not actually on the same, on a par with us. And to actually be able to take, uh, to explain that, you know, 25% at least of our workers are now on hourly paid contracts, that 20, our salaries have dropped by 25% in 10 years, to say that, you know, to be able to align the paying of your rent with, you know, having to, you know, loads of people actually just sleeping in their offices <laughs> as a consequence, and, you know, university staff going to food banks. You know, that was kind of, you, you have to get to that sort of level of understanding so that you do start building those larger political alignments and you start to talk about this is what neoliberalism has done. You're not talking about, you're talking about a, a political formation. You're talking about a number of different conjunctures that have come together to create this particular um, moment of exploitation that, that all workers are feeling, actually, in, in, uh, particularly in the UK in what we used to call the public sector. Uh, it's really been hollowed out in all sorts of ways. So, and that coming together has suddenly made the media also used to think we were just prissy elites. Of now, actually, now they want to hear from university sectors, and you, we're getting kind of commentators who would usually give us a really aggressive time, open up and say, "Tell us why? Why is this going on? Why are we yet again our students aren't getting their grades this year because we." also do marking and assessment boycotts as a big part of the actions that have been ongoing. So, and that's a pretty tough gig to pull off, actually, the marking and assessment boycott, but it's very, very effective because everything comes to a halt, <coughs> essentially. So it's, um, you know, I think, I also think there's something about our field, talking about media and communications, that is at the forefront of a current um, kind of, far right, I would say backlash, but rollback really. So it, we are, you know, I don't know whether you're getting this the same in the US as we are in the UK, but the whole anti-woke vibe is very much against, um, you know, uh, the media studies teaching things like, you know, gender studies and race studies and what is this, you know, and these students don't get proper jobs. They just go out and, you know, they, what are they doing? This is not the sort of education we want. So our field has a particular, um, you know, investment in having these actions. And really, um, this is also about the future of that left formation. Mm -hmm. If we don't fight this moment, wow, in 10 years' time, where are we going to be? Ditto. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, I just want to say, in, in Canada, the history of higher ed unionization has, well, historically, it's been uh, a very defensive posture. So not only do we need to re-envision who our opponent is, but we have to re-envision what a union is and what a union can do. And in, in Canada, it's a, been a losing strategy because if you see your union just as a service union, uh, always in a defensive posture, every time you go to the table, you're bargaining for a smaller and smaller piece of the pie, right? Because other things, forces have snuck in the back door and, you know, done away with collegial governance or done, you know, over or, or overhauled workload or whatever it might be and you're at the table under these new conditions that you've had no say over. So it's not a winning strategy. A winning strategy is to go on the offensive and all means all the things that Natalie and Mark have talked about and Todd have talked about, which is wall-to-wall -wall organizing, which means so that you don't despair up in the back. It means making connections with other employee groups on campus creating a unity group or some kind of group of workers groups on campus and talking across your positions. Um, I think that's one way of not despairing because you can you can feel more power that way. As Todd was saying, uh, organizing according to your category is losing. Uh, so that, the, that's what I would say. I think that really we need to, and then internally, in terms of how you organize yourselves, of course, issues like in Canada specifically, indigenization, decoloniality, you have to make sure you're creating space for new voices constantly 
not just by getting people to you know show up at meetings, but by putting them on your board or by paying adjuncts money to serve the, to work for the union and making sure you have appropriate representation that way, so that who you are internally reflects what you want to create externally. That is that those two things need to to mirror each other. Mm -hmm. So I would say that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I first want to talk about the tenure track faculty, Yeshiva, and, and I just want to make one point here, and it's not for every university, it might not be for the university you flagged, the Catholic University, but in uh, the winter of 21, the student, U, UAW Student Researchers United became a new union of 17,000 workers in the UC system. They did not ask the California Public Relations Commission to let them be a union. They did not go and take a legal uh, route. They struck for recognition, right? There's nothing that stops private university faculty from striking for recognition in this country. The only thing that stops it is our fear and our embeddedness with management in private universities. Now, not every private university is the same. <laughs> But that's what needs to happen, right? If, if you want it, and they're going to yeshiva you, there's still a way to get it, but you've got to organize for it, right? And it's right in front of you if you do, but you've got to take it, or else you're going to be screwed at your institution. So I, I want to say that, and there's only one other thing I want to say, which is, to the point, I, I completely agree about the IATSE the point and the wall-to-wall, -wall, and I want to make it again and just explain how it happens. And Rutgers is an imperfect beast. We make a lot of mistakes, but how it's happening there, right? There was a pandemic. The management wanted to attack the most vulnerable, right? They wanted to go after adjunct faculty, and they wanted to go after long-term service employees, often uh, disproportionately women and people of color. And what did we, 12 unions, 30,000, 25,000 workers strong do? We said no, and we said we're gonna demand a program that doesn't let you fire them, keeps everyone whole, but has faculty who couldn't be affected furlough, but furloughed through a work share program that kept them whole, right? And the point there is, it, is solidarity, right? It's solidarity, first of all, it's messy, right, and hard, right, when you organize, and we did with students this time around in our communities, and the shit got bumpy, and it always will, and there's no way forward, and we need to figure out how to do that. But also, I, I just, I want to be clear that there is no way to build a, a cross-university solidarity with uh, custodial staff if you're not figuring out how to put yourself on the line for that custodial staff. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's in front of us, right? Some of us need to build our own locals, but we also need to figure out what it looks like to create real solidarity, and that really helps to build. And so just I'll finish this one point, which is off the pandemic and off that, we were able to build an alliance. Now, not all of the workers at Rutgers went on strike this spring. 9,003 unions did, and another 11,000, well, about 4,000 4, of those weren't out of contract. So another five or 6,000 didn't, right? And so we only got part of the way there. But there's a model, right? And that model is actually trying to build real lines of solidarity that are based in the work conditions you all face together. Yeah. With that, noting the time, first, I want to thank all of our panelists here for being game to engage this discussion. Thank you so much. This is incredibly meaningful. I'll, I'll moderate a panel anytime where I end up taking six pages of notes in the process myself. Uh, I also want to thank you for going a little bit over. You've been very generous. So my thanks to all of you for coming and thinking about our janitorial laborers. Please take all your bottles and such out of here and put them in the proper receptacles on your way out. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning uh, at our panels starting at 9 o'clock. Thanks very much. Have terrific evenings. Mm -hmm.